The Word of God for our consideration this morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 14, just verse 8. Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? This is the Word of the Lord, we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Your fellow redeemed friends in Christ Jesus, recipients of God's grace and a Lutheran heritage, Martin Luther was not the first, nor was he the last person to point out the, the theological and the moral, moral errors in the late medieval church of Rome. There were others who did it, and, and there were other groups that left the church of Rome in protest as well, and yet names of some of those Protestant leaders, names like John Huss, like John Calvin, like John Wycliffe, many of us probably don't even know those names. And yet even the secular world, uh, publications like Time Magazine and A&E, at the turn of the century, recognized that Martin Luther was the third most influential person of the entire millennia. So what was it that made Luther different? What set Luther apart? Why is he still front and center on the minds of many people, even many people who are not Christian and not Lutheran today? The amazing thing is that it was nothing about Luther. It was all about the weapon that God had given to Luther. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, the principle that that everything for our faith and our life is to come from Scripture and nowhere else. That was the secret to Luther's strength, his courage, and, and why what Luther taught lasts to this day. Because it was not his word, it was God's word. And in the, the late... Middle Ages, when Luther proclaimed the clear word of God, it was like a a trumpet blasting a clear note amidst the, the theological and moral confusion of the age. I probably don't have to tell you that we are once again living in a morally confused age. In our country, it is legal for a woman to kill her own unborn child, but in many places, spanking a child is viewed as child abuse. Marriage, which God created to be only between a man and a woman for life, has now been redefined by the highest court in the land to include two men or two women, and only the Lord knows what else will be coming into marriage in the future. Even right here in our own local public school districts, they have bought into the lie that gender is something that you can change as easily and frequently as you can change your clothes. We are living in a morally confused age and a morally, uh, theologically confused age. And so today, we need to heed Paul's advice We need to pray that God would bless us with the the gift that he gave to Martin Luther that we may be a, a clear trumpet call based on sola scriptura, scripture alone. Because that is the only solid foundation for not only morality, but also for our faith. Now in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 here, Paul is admonishing the the church in Corinth for the way they conducted their services. They they were in the the habit of conducting services in a a language that most of the people there did not understand. They were were conducting it in tongues. And, And Paul doesn't mince words here. He says, if you're gathering and someone is standing up in front of you and he's speaking in a language that no one understands or if the, the message is, is unintelligible or if it's confused or if it's compromised, that message is worthless. In today's terms, we would say that message is fake news. And so Paul concludes his argument. He says, stop doing that. Speak in the the language of the people, or if you're going to speak in tongues, there must be someone to interpret it. He says, in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others 
than 10,000 words in a tongue. The church in Luther's day had a, a related problem, but it wasn't the same problem. The, the clear moral teaching that God handed down to Moses on, on stone tablets in the Ten Commandments had been, for the most part, lost by the medieval Catholic church. Instead of, of holding up God's will and saying, live according to this, the Catholic church had invented its own path of morality. And it, it taught people that if you obey these man-made laws, that is how you will earn God's favor. That is how you can get to heaven. And Luther, being you know, one of the best Catholics of the time, he bought into it. The church told him that being a monk is the, the best way to guarantee that you will go to heaven when you die. And so Luther said, I'm going to become a monk. And he was, he was a monk's monk. He would... He saw that there was moral value in going around barefoot, especially in the winter time. He, he slept on a cold stone floor. He beat his body. He prayed for hours and hours and hours on end. He would starve himself. He committed himself to a vow of chastity and poverty because this is what the church said would please God. If you want to get on God's good side, obey these rules. So Luther did it. He did it with all of his heart and all of his soul. He even said this, uh, looking back on those years, he said, I was a good monk, and I kept the rules of my order so strictly that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. However, when, when God granted Luther his grace, when he opened Luther's eyes to go back to the source, go back to Scripture, Luther found a completely new and revolutionary, at the time, understanding of the law. Now, this may not sound revolutionary for us, but, but it is. If you want to please God, do exactly what God says when He tells you to do it in exactly the way He tells you to do it. In other words, morality is not something that is, is invented, created by the mind of man. It is something given to us by God. The Ten Commandments are the only guidelines, the only trustworthy guidelines for life in this world to keep us on the path that God wants us to walk. Luther embraced those guidelines, the Ten Commandments. He, he explained them. He passed them down to us in his catechisms. He shared this revolutionary understanding that that God is not pleased when we go our own way. When we choose our own good works, He is only pleased when we do what He wants us to do, what He commands us to do. Luther held on to that. Even though, like us, it hurt him because he understood that he couldn't do it. The question is, do we have that same understanding, that same love for the law of God? Do we still regard God's commandments as the guardrails on our lives? Or has something else taken their place? I, I suppose the more pertinent question for us today is, do we know God's moral, unchanging will for us? If I were to pick out one of you and say, can you recite the Ten Commandments and their meanings for all of us right now? Would you be able to do that? When's the last time you cracked open your catechism at home? Or has it sat on a dusty shelf since you were confirmed maybe decades ago? The thing is, how can we hope to live according to God's will if we don't know it? How can we hope to share God's unchanging moral will with anyone we know, anyone we love, with our own children if we don't know what it is? Paul would say if we don't know what God's will is, we are like a trumpet that someone stuffed a, a ball of cotton into. It's not sounding a clear note because it's not Sounding God's clear will. And so one of the things we thank God for is that he sent Luther to bring back that principle that, 
that morality is not established by, by popular opinion or by what the highest court and the law says or by what we each want. It is established by God himself. And, and just as that was so important for Luther to bring back to the, the late medieval Catholic Church, it's so important for us today because you know as well as I do that our society is a, a, a moral wasteland. You know as well as I do that, that the world teaches a morality that is based on relativism. That is, it's, it's constantly changing. What is right and what is wrong is not based on the, the law of God that is unchanging, but based on changing factors like, well, who was involved and what was the situation and, and what were the feelings and what was their intention. They're constantly changing. And, and relativism is no way to live. Relativism only leads to contradiction and sadness and despair. And finally, those who live relativistically will do so all the way to hell. And the sad thing is, is that that relativism has seeped into the Christian church. When, when many churches deal with difficult issues of, of morality and behavior, instead of asking, well, what does the Scripture say? Let's go back to the source. Instead, they say, well, what does the latest Christian bestseller say? Or what, does, what do popular opinions say? Or what does the, the savvy, persuasive leader say that he heard from God? Or, or what feels right? Or what makes sense? And, and the sad result is what we see in the Christian church in America right now. You can go down the street to the local Lutheran church, and there is a female pastor standing in the pulpit. It has seeped into the church that churches that are consecrating homosexual marriages on an alt, at an altar before God himself. It has seeped into a, a church where the message is, is no longer the pure law and gospel of God, but, but social theories and, and talking about climate change and social justice and, and equality and tolerance. And so if the, the Catholic Church at the time of Luther needed a reformation, it is certainly clear that the church in America, the Christian church in America, needs a reformation just as badly. Now, it's a little bit different. In, in Luther's time, morality was established by one man, by the Pope. Today, morality is established by everyone. And anyone, right? You, you've probably heard people say, uh, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. And you know what they mean by that, right? They mean they do not accept an objective standard like God's Word or God Himself to tell them how to live their lives. Rather, they will base it on what they feel, on what seems right to them. If you want to talk in technical terms, that's called following your conscience. That conscience is the little voice in our head that tells us what we're doing is right or whether it's wrong. And, and that sounds good, right? God gave us our conscience to do just that, to direct us on the way that is right versus the way that is wrong. The only problem is that since the fall into sin, that little voice in your head is broken. It is not perfectly in line with God's will. It does not always lead you in a way that is pleasing to God. Now, you may say, but Pastor, we just heard in John chapter 8, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, I will set you free. And that's true. Jesus promises that when you hold to the gospel about him, your conscience will be free from your sins against the law. But Jesus did not come to set us free from the law. Let's let Jesus himself speak. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. We are not free to choose our own moral standards in life. We are still creatures of our Creator, and His will is the only valid one 
for us. His will is the one that we need to be proclaiming to a world that is hopelessly lost, that is dying in sin, that is morally confused. So God grant that we may be this clear trumpet blast of godly morality, the Ten Commandments, the, the law that our Creator has given to us and said, here, this is how I want you to live. The law by which each and every one of us will have to stand before God and be judged. The law that is good and holy that the psalmist says sheds light on our path through this dark world. The law that teaches us that God's wrath is real. And His anger over sin is real. That hell is real. Because only when we are proclaiming that firm, unchanging, moral will of God, will we realize how hopeless we are to save ourselves. Only when we realize that God's demands are up here and we will never get there, will we fall, throw ourselves on God's mercy, drop on our faces at His feet, and say, Lord, have pity on me, a sinner. Only when we understand how how rigid God's will is, will we ask the more to, most important question that you can ever ask? How then can I be saved? That's the question that really drove Luther. He, he tried the, the way of being a monk. He, he tried obeying all the laws given by the Pope, and he could not find peace for his conscience. He, he tried beating his body, but his heart was still terrified by God's wrath until God gave him that other all-important insight that peace with God is not something that we earn or do. It is something that God gives to us. Again, it, it may sound too basic for us. You may laugh at how obvious it is, but if you want to know how to get to heaven, if you want to know the only solid foundation for your faith, if you want to know how you can have peace with God, read God's Word. The answers are in there for your sin, for your failures, for, for the wrath of God. The, the solution is in there. And again, in Luther's day, 500 years ago, that was so confused. That message was not being clearly broadcast because the, the so-called theological experts of the day, they said, well, you, you might be able to read the words on the page, but the real meaning of Scripture is not in the words on the page, it's behi somewhere behind the words. And so your average everyday Christian was told, don't even, don't even think about reading the Bible for yourself. You have, to, you have to wait for an expert, hopefully one with an incredibly wild imagination, to tell you what this truly means. And so your, your average person didn't know the Bible, didn't read the Bible, and was trusting someone who wasn't actually interpreting the Bible to tell them what the Bible said. And again, Luther's revolutionary breakthrough was so basic that we might laugh at it. If you want to know what the Bible says, read the Bible. If you want to know what God is telling you to base your faith on, to believe, read God's Word. Now certainly... Not every verse in Scripture is going to be clear the first time you read it, but what it does mean is that when you are reading the Word of God, you are hearing what God has to say to you. You're not hearing it filtered through some other person, some other man. You are hearing from God directly, and there is no better way, and there is no better thing on which to build your faith. Now, I know that, that, that that's a rare message in today's world because we're still being told that your average Christian can't possibly read the Bible for themselves. You've got to look to the guy who's standing on a stage in an arena somewhere with 10,000 people to tell you what the Bible means. We're still being told by so-called experts that the Bible may contain God's Word, but it also contains a whole lot of errors. We're still being told by some that that the, the meaning of the Word of God is not in the clear language of the, the words on the page, but is somewhere behind it. The Word of God is clear. The Word of God 
is, is a light for us. I, I think, sadly, the thing that is, is most destroying, the, the clear trumpet blast of the Word of God, of the Gospel today, is that many people, many average everyday Christians, even though they have access to a Bible on their phone and, and at home and on the computer, simply don't read it. And again, if you want a basis for your faith, if you want to know what God wants you to believe, you must be reading His Word. Why? Sola Scriptura, a Latin phrase that most people don't care about in a world where everything is relative and everything is subjective and people are actually offended if you tell them that this, this here is right and that is wrong. Why would we continue to to proclaim such an unpopular message in a world that has no use for it. Well, it goes back to that little nursery rhyme song that you learned a long time ago. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. This is all important still to this day, still 500 years later, because our salvation is hanging in the balance. The only way we know that God loved the world and sent His Son to die for the world is because the Bible tells us so. The only way that we know that God credits Jesus' perfect life to our account so that we are standing perfect before Him right now is because the Bible tells us so. The only way that we know that Jesus has died for all of those times where we decided, no, God, your morality is too strict. I'm going to go my own way. The only way we know we are forgiven is because the Bible tells us so. The only way that we know that we will go to heaven when we die is because the Bible tells us so. And the only way we know until then in a world that is growing increasingly hostile to Christians that we have nothing to fear is because the Bible tells us so. And when we're honest with ourselves, when I'm honest with myself, I have nothing better to pass on to Jude. Nothing of more value. Nothing that won't be stolen or or burned up or washed away than the Word of God. Because even though the grass of the field and the flowers fall, the Word of the Lord stands forever. So God grant that we may be that clear trumpet blast. That we may proclaim in a world that is morally and theologically confused that the only basis, the only firm foundation for morality is the written will of God and the only basis for our faith, the only hope we have of heaven is the pure gospel of God. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen.